Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Epistle of James is one of the uh, epistles towards the end of the New Testament, other than the epistles of St. Paul. There are two epistles of Peter, one epistle of James, and three epistles of John, and one epistle of Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, of course, but Judas the Apostle. Um, the the epistle, apostles are obviously uh, uh, preparing the beginning of the church, laying the foundations of the church. The twelve apostles have been closely instructed, well, eleven of them at least, have been closely instructed by our Lord for the three years. They've watched him, they've observed his example, they've listened to his teaching, and they have, they have after Easter, uh, 50 days after Easter, was the great feast of the Holy Ghost, the feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit, dis Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, no difference. Ghost is simply the Germanic word, Geist, uh, spirit is the Latin word spiritus, no difference. Uh, the Holy Ghost will, will come, and in the in the epist uh, in the apostle in the uh, uh, gospel of today, uh, our Lord is, says that he needs to go. He needs to leave his apostles uh, in order to um, in order to send the Holy Ghost, because if if, uh, the Holy Ghost, if, if our Lord was still incarnate and in amongst men, it would be difficult for the Holy, Holy Ghost to come in any shape, size or form, so to speak, and then it would seem as though there are two gods. Whereas, of course, God, our divine Lord is God the Son, the Holy Ghost is God the Holy Ghost, absolutely equal in all respects, Equal in majesty, equal in glory, equal in power, equal in all respects, um, except that the Son proceeds from the Father and the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Son and the Father. So the, the Apostles' te teaching is laying the foundations of the Church and they're laying down the very basics of Christian living. And so James explains that there, there is... There, uh, every best gift, every perfect gift is from heaven coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no change nor shadow of alteration. Uh, God cannot change, which is why uh, he cannot learn our names, so to speak, from watching what's going, down on, going on, down, down on earth. He has seen the whole history of mankind, the whole history of, of before, in eternity, he sees all of these things, and therefore, that's why scripture says, uh, I, have, I have loved you with a perpetual love, with an eternal love. It's true for each single one of us, that from eternity, Almighty God knew our names, he knew who he would be, and he loved us from eternity. He, and because of his love, he created us. Now, most men fall into hell. It's a, it's a great, great shame. The psalmist says he weeps when he thinks of all the sinners that will not make it to heaven. But we had the chance, and God gives us a chance. And it's out of his love that he gives us a chance, and it's out of his love that he watches over every single one of us to help us to get to heaven. And therefore the events of our life are designed to help us to get to heaven. It may not look like that. It may not look like the way of helping Londoners to heaven to drop some kind of bomb on them, which surely is happening soon. Uh, that because that is the best thing, that will be the best thing to send any significant number of Londoners still to heaven. At this moment, the Londoners are massively turned away from God, forgetting God, scorning God. Um, but uh, that's the, the only thing that will help them to heaven is a serious threat of great suffering which will make them get down on their knees again, pray to God, and give them a chance of going to heaven. 
Therefore, if and when the bomb lands or threatens to land, comes to land, don't think this is the cruelty of God. It will be the goodness of God, the only possible way of sending, still getting still to heaven. If he's not going to take away people's free will, if he insists on that we're going to choose ourselves, then uh, he's uh, then the only way to stop most people, nearly all people today, choosing hell is to threaten a punishment and then deliver a severe punishment, which will make people suffer. It's in suffering that we learn. That's a principle of an ancient Greek pro, uh, um, the poet, tra tragedian, uh, Aeschylus. Uh, and suffering is learning. Look at your past life and think if it wasn't when you were most suffering that you learned the most, what really matters and what really works, and what is not just illusion and la-la land. Most people today, uh, the, the world today as a whole, is living in la-la land. It's preferring its own foolish will to the will of God, to the will or order of God. God created creation, obviously, and with it he created, he created creation with an order. That order is, does not come from us. The order of creation comes from God. And it, if we live in accordance with that order, we will please God and go to heaven. If we live against that order by sinning significantly against any of the Ten Commandments, we will not uh, please God, we will not go to heaven. He leaves us free, but he, his commandments are commandments, they are not options. Therefore, uh, and St. James is giving instructions to Christians how to live according to God's order. Um, of, of his own will hath he begotten us by the word of truth. Truth is in the mind, reality is in things. Things in things outside the mind. Truth in the mind is the correspondence of the, of the mind, of my mind, to what is outside without the will interfering and trying to impose its own version of what there is uh, outside. Therefore, uh, uh, the order of God is in things, it's in reality, it's outside us, it doesn't come from us, but we must live in accordance with it if we want to go to heaven. If we don't want to go to heaven, well then we've got, we're free from the law of justice, as St. Paul says, and we are but we are subjects of the law of sin. And if we don't want to be to subjects of the law of sin, then we need to be subjects of the law of truth and of God. And so, my dearest brethren, let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak and slow to anger. That's a great principle. Because the anger of man does not work the justice of God. I'm not going to make people get better by getting angry with them, broadly speaking. Uh, our Lord very occasionally got angry, for instance, when he threw, when it was an anger in accordance with God, in accordance with the will of God, when he threw the money makers, the money changers, out of the temple with a whip. Uh, that's, that's the wrath of God, that's the righteous, the righteous anger of God against those who break his law, like turning the temple into a den of thieves, of commerce. Let every man be swift to hear but slow to speak. Better, but silence is golden. Let Christians not say just anything and everything that comes into their mind, minds. Let not everything in the mind immediately pass through the mouth. Let the Christian think what he's saying and make sure that it, what he's saying is useful. And let it not be out of angry except in very exceptional circumstances. Because my anger is not going to restore, to restore the order of God. My anger may well make people still more angry with God himself. Wherefore, casting away all uncleanness and abundance of naughtiness, with meekness receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. That's the truth, the truth of God, which of course tells what is the reality, and warns us what is the reality, so that we can conform ourselves to the will of God and do what he says. 
Very interesting, yesterday, uh, the coronation of uh, King Charles III, the, it, it's, there are many Catholic elements in the text. There are many un-Catholic elements in the text. I don't know how many of you are possibly watching or listening, but uh, in, in accordance with God, the, the, men, the mention alone of God, I don't know if everybody pre present there in Westminster Abbey had a copy of the text, the whole text of the consecration. We had it on, uh, on television or on the internet, and there were the subtitles as well. And they showed the old-fashioned idea of a king, the Catholic idea of a king. The ceremony comes in, the, still today, the ceremony has a lot of Catholic elements in it. The idea of a king who rules, who's not just ruled by the people around him, like uh, uh, the English monarch today. Uh, it was interesting to watch the, uh, how uh, the, the Charles sat, was, was directed everywhere he went and was told everywhere what he was to do. And he was given a crib sheet, so to speak. Uh, I, I have a great deal of sympathy because it's very easy, unless you have a head for ceremonies, to forget what comes next. And I recognize him looking to people around and wondering what, or at what now. I could see it clearly. But uh, the, the, what we saw, so to speak, was rather uh, the, the ruler being ruled. The, the, the modern, a modern king doesn't rule. He's a constitutional monarch, it's called. He's, he acts, he's under the constitution. And in the text of, the, of yesterday was that the, the, you know, he's going to defend Protestants. He vows to, pretend, uh, 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 to, to defend Protestantism because it's the law of the land. Man's law, in, it's as though man, the law of man imposes on Almighty God what Almighty God is going to want from his king. Hmm. Who's king then? The, the, not the king himself, but the people around him by the law. Parliament, democracy. It's a different world. The, the, the world of the original ceremony is one in which the king was king and was and, and swears oaths that he's going to defend the order of God, not an order of man, not an order of parliament, not an order that the people vote for, but an order that he is there as the representative of God to represent and, if necessary, to die for. There are kings, uh, there, are, uh, there, are, there have been good kings, good Catholic kings. There's usually one saintly king for every Catholic nation that has been, I think it's true to say. King Edward of England, King Louis of France, uh, Louis IX of France, uh, Henry II, Emperor of Germany, and so on. And these kings that have ruled in accordance with the order of God have done great good to the people. They've established God's order among the people. Whose order is established by modern parliaments? By unseen powers who stay out of view, who control the newspapers and the media, and make sure that they're not put forward as the real rulers. They don't appear as the real rulers in uh, the media or in front of the public. The, rule, the real rulers who control the media and make sure that the media sets up for the dumb people, the godless and blind people who've turned their backs on God and turned their backs on the order of God to make sure that they believe that they're being ruled by their parliament. As some people say, today's parliaments are the best parliaments that money can buy. The, 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 the members of parliament and of Congress, for instance, in the United States, are very well paid. They, they have been, originally they were, they, they, they didn't, it was gentry who were not given any money for being a member of parliament. But as democracy, as the people have come, become more and more important, and the, 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 or let's just say, as the people have been given the illusion that they are more and more important, the real powers stay hidden. And that's where we are today. And they are not interested in the order of God. On the contrary, they are interested in setting up their own order, which is an order of the devils. 
And that's why the world is in such a mess as it is in today, and that's why it's going to be punished. There's nothing else is going to be able to restore uh, the order of God with such corrupt people as we are today. And the corruption could be seen, eat, could be seen, so to speak, eating into the old Catholic ceremony. Bless the English people, they still have a, a monarchy which is envied by many of the nations that have got rid of their monarchy, or emptied out, completely emptied out their monarchy. The English at least keep the appearances. <gasps> that the reality, that's another, that's another question. My dear friends, it's up to you and me to put back, to, 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 to put back amongst the people, amongst the people that are all around you today, the office of own soul, uh, to put back the order of God. The order of God must, must, must guide and control our lives. We want to be the servants of God and not the servants of sin. We want the justice of God and not the justice of the world. And we want rulers of God and not rulers of the world. It's not as though monarchy is the very, very best. For instance, you, if you know the Old Testament, you remember that there was a moment when the uh, people wanted a king. The people asked for a king. They asked, uh, they asked Samuel. Samuel told them, you shouldn't be wanting a king. You shouldn't need a king. Oh, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. All right, said Samuel, well then, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll ask God. And God, as a punishment, gave them a king. Because the king would not be, would, the king would be King Saul, and it wouldn't be that good, that good a king. King David was a very good king. He was very pious, he was, he was a sinner, but he was uh, repentant for his sin, and he governed well. He was a great warrior also and a great musician in addition. Uh, an all-rounder we would say today. There are good kings, but king, it's not that, it's not that the king, king, kingship or a, a monarchy is necessarily the best. If the king is bad, better a good democracy than a bad monarchy. What is, what frame of life, what framework of life what framework of politics is most helping people to get to heaven? That's what the state is about. The state politics and the state are to help people to get to heaven because that's what people exist for. That's why people are created by God to go to heaven. And the state's business is to help people to get to heaven. Samuel, the prophet Samuel, knew that the people had done the Jewish people at that point in time, the Israelites had been very godly without a king. They'd had prophets like himself, but they had not had a king. And a king would, he warned them, he told them, a king is going to take your children, he's going to take your properties, he's going to govern over you in accordance with his own interests, he's going to look after his own interests, he's not necessarily going to look after yours. I warn you, now the people still said, we want a king. The people were losing their virtue. If they were really virtuous, that's what matters, the virtue of the people. If the people are good without a king, that's better than if they need a king to be good. But it's be a king is better than a democracy, a corrupt modern democracy where the people are not good because they, 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 don't, they hardly believe in sin. They think everything that comes from themselves is wonderful. They think that anything that's democratic is wonderful, when in fact if they're corrupt, the democracy is going to be corrupt, the government will be corrupt, and the government will help them to lose their souls, not to save their souls. And so, uh, yesterday's, yesterday's ceremony showed these signs of, a, of, of England once Catholic, an England where Edward the Confessor was a saint, and there were good kings, but the kings were still going to lose their power. Uh, when, when just before Charles was crowned yesterday, uh, he was dressed in, he, he was left behind, divested himself of what, what, what he was wearing, and he was left in a white shirt, uh, an important white shirt. 
and then they clothed him in two golden garments, and then he received the crown. But before he received the crown, he was in a white shirt, an unmistakable reminder of the death of Louis XVI in France, uh, who was guillotined, uh, machine slicing off his neck, uh, slicing off his head, slicing through his neck, slicing off his head, uh, in 1793. And uh, at that, at that uh, in Catholic France, they did allow him, in his white shirt, preparing to lie down on the plank where the guillotine would cut his head off, uh, in his white shirt, he was allowed to see a priest. And it was actually an English priest, an English priest who, who said the last, gave him absolution just before he died. And there he was in his white shirt, hands bound surely, probably behind, surely behind his back. And there he was saying his last uh, act of contrition, receiving absolution, and then he went to his death. And around him, of course, soldiers, the revolutionaries in control. And the revolutionaries not caring for the order of God, in fact, killing the, rep the prime representative in France of the order of God, which was France's king. And France became a savage and brutal state for a little while. And the world was never the same again after the French Revolution. And the key act of the French Revolution was the, the guillotine of the king. England, it was in 1649, that England cut off the head of its king, but that's because England was Protestant, had been already Protestant for more than 100 years since Henry VIII. And um, those, the anti-monarchical anti elements, the revolutionary elements, uh, had already had so much Protestantism in England that, uh, that we, we, got, we got to cut off the head of our king ways back, well, uh, more than 100 years before the French finally cut off the head of their king. But there was Charles in a white shirt before he was crowned, Louis XVI in a white shirt before he was guillotined. But the modern world is in control of the kings. Secret control, hidden control, disguised control, because those who are the real rulers are criminals. They're, anti they're against God. They are not the friends of God. They're the enemies of God. And therefore, they are children of darkness, and therefore they cannot show that they are in control. But they are in control. And uh, the, the English king is, still has a fraction of power. I think Queen Elizabeth, for instance, at one point years ago, intervened in Australian politics. Because in Australia, which used to be a dominion of the British Empire, the queen, the English monarch, is still, I think, still, but the, the, the anti-monarchical elements are, 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 are very much at work to liberate the dominions and colonies from the mother country. The same, in, it's along the same line of thinking. It's along the lines of apostasy, getting away from God, getting away from the person of a, of a, of a Christian king, and replacing him with a real rule of godless, enemies, the enemies of God, who want to create a quite different order and a quite different world. And that's what we see all around us. Interesting, the ceremony, the elements which reflected still the Catholic idea of a king, when kings were Catholic, after they had been perhaps virtuous people, like the Israelites before they were given by God the King Saul. In any case, um, the, 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 the ceremony of the, of the crowning of a monarch definitely still has these Catholic elements and then it has these, these anti-Catholic elements. The law of Parliament, the religion of the, the, of the land established by the law and the ceremony spoke, the text spoke of the law of the land, the law of England, the, 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 the religion by the law of England. <gasps> And that's Catholicism twisted right out of shape. Oh my. Well, my dear friends, it depends, it depends upon you and I, as St. James says, to live by the truth, that the truth, the, the truth of God's order should show in each of our lives, 
should be ended. That's what that's what God that's what Almighty that's why Almighty God leaves us still to live in this difficult world for Catholics. That's why he allows the world to get more difficult. He can easily allow the Catholics to go to, to, go to the scaffold, uh, as like in Tyburn, a, a few miles ago, where so many English martyrs were tortured and before they were killed, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Our Almighty God and his true church have bitter enemies. Make no mistake. Don't think everybody is sweet and everybody is nice and everybody means well and everybody is sincere because it's simply not true. Reality is, like in our Lord's own day, he had enemies bitter enough to crucify him, to send him to the cross. It depends on us, my dear friends, to, at our own little level, which counts, it's in among the people, and you and I meet a number of people, you, proper, you meet more people out in the world than I do. I lead a somewhat sheltered life, but it's, it, it, you have from God a mission to demonstrate the life, the, the life and the order of God in a very godless world. And if you, can, if you can take it, if you can manage it, you will have a handsome reward. And the best, the best help to live in this world is the prayer through Our Lady by the Rosary. It's what she always asks for when she appears in apparitions, and she's now appearing all over the world to, to try to save as many souls as possible before it's too late and before so many are swept down to hell. Ask, pray for the strength to pray the rosary, for instance, and to obey the commandments of her divine son so that the light an example and truth of God can go through our lives into our poor world in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.